starting with six discard spells, splitting between Inquisition of Kozilek and Thoughtseize. Yeah, it's, I mean, some of the amulet hands, for example, like just a Summer Bloom and a Titan and a lot of lands, you know, a Thoughtseize deals so much damage to. So Jarvis will start out on Teleria West. Russell with Thoughtseize, and we'll see what Jarvis is on. It is two bounce lands, so Simic Growth Chamber and Golgari Rot Farm. He has Summoner's Pact, Pact of Negation, Ancient Stirrings, and Primeval Titan here. So this feels like the type of hand that's pretty robust against a discard spell because there's multiple lines of attack for from Jarvis's side, no matter what gets no matter what gets taken. Yeah, it's not one of those fast hands. This is a hand that does a pretty good job of real of just, you know, playing a robust game and Amulet has some good draws in that. Uh, that said, if Russell has something like an early Liliana, he can really pick this apart. Uh, Pact of Negation is unlikely to matter in this matchup. It's not a strong draw for Jarvis. Um, Russell's going to go ahead and take the Summoner's Pact, and that does take some of the speed away from Jarvis's draw, because he, well, I was going to say he would Pact for Azusa Lost, but Seeking, but he did draw it for the turn, so that so. might not be what he does. Simic Girl Chamber will pick up Teleria West, and we move back over to Russell. You know what's sometimes a nice card to have not be legal in non-rotating formats? Wasteland. Oh yeah, it's really, be... <laughs> it's really nice. It's really nice yeah. that you can start, you can dip your toes in the water with some of these fancier dual lands because uh, hand destruction's really a jerk. Yeah. I mean, there's still a lot of ways you can get blown out by playing a bounce land. I'm mean, Tectonic Edge, Fulminator Mage, Cryptic Command. A lot different than Wasteland in That's terms of. True. I mean, Wasteland would. Com this deck wouldn't even exist. It'll be a Tarmor Wave on turn two for Russell. And by tapping out here, Jarvis does have... If he hadn't untapped land, he would have had free reign to Azusa this turn. But he doesn't. He just has the another Bounce Land and the Teleria West. So he stirrings for Colony Garden. Colony Garden is a one-of that protects Amulet. The turn you play a Titan, it protects it from an onboard Liliana. Also, it could just be a nice chump blocker to have access to. Absolutely. There's a lot of different one-of lands you can run, and you can't actually run all of them, so it is somewhat meta-dependent. Colony Garden, for example, when the deck first started, was not typically in lists. It, you play it when Liliana's a thing. Right. And we do, we do see an attack from Russell. It puts Jarvis down to 17. And we'll see where Russell goes from here. So it feels like in this matchup, very important for Russell to be having a clock going as well. Don't want to give that, that amulet player a lot of time to get everything set up. Yeah, well, what he needs to do is just grind through the different threats. Either he needs to kill Jarvis or grind through the different threats that Jarvis has. He, right now, Jarvis isn't representing anything more than a turn six Titan. But what the deck's Titans do is that they're very good at finding your next threat. So once, I get, once he get, Jarvis gets a Titan, you should expect some sort of threat every turn until Jarvis runs out. Kitchen Finks for Russell. Now these tap down, Jarvis will get to play a full three lands this turn. He'll get to go all the way up to six. Azusa gives Jarvis two more, two additional land drops every turn. So we can go Celestia Sanctuary, picking up Colony Garden, replay Colony Garden, get a second plant, and go ahead and probably play, and then play his bounce land again. I am positive that at one point I owned numerous copies of Azusa Lost But Seeking and sold them to dealers for, you know, a that, dime or a quarter. That card's or expensive. Now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> if so I still had all my Azusas, I probably wouldn't be in the booth. Just be th on the beach somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Commander All Stars in the stack. It also plays Vesuva. That's a card mm. that's not cheap either now. Swing from Russell puts Jarvis down to 11. And another Kitchen Finks. This is not the kind of draw that you want in this matchup. Yep. Um, it's a lot of fair creatures, and Jarvis' deck is about to be pretty unfair here. Two Summoner's Packs in hand, a Primeval Titan, and a Pact of Negation. So he's going to get his first Primeval Titan here. And we'll see what he does with it. He should assume that Russell's going to kill the first one, but you may see him set up the Slayer Stronghold anyway and going and getting it so that next turn when he packs for a Titan, he can go ahead and give it haste. He doesn't have Amulet, so he'd have to get that card preemptively. And Jarvis, with all these uh, gardens, really setting up a nice base of chump blocking. He has a lot of turns to work with here. So even if the first Titan doesn't stick, 
it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I think his play should, is Gruul Turf plus Slayer's Stronghold. He does have the white mana in Celestia Sanctuary. You don't want to get the Boros Garrison because the Bo that's the other land you play. That's part of your combo finishes. So by getting the Boros Garrison, you actually, like, if he were to draw Amulet, it would not be as good if he gets the Boros Garrison here. Sure. He's going to go for, yeah, Garrison Slayer Stronghold. That's unlikely to matter too much, though. Bouncing Colony Garden. So this does mean next turn he'll be able to Pact for Titan, play Titan, give it haste, and and should have blue Pact backup. He could double Pact that turn. The Titan triggers will give him enough mana to pay for all of that if he does it. Pretty impressive stuff. Uh, and it looked like Jarvis's hand, as you mentioned, was going to be on the slow side this game. But I mean, one copy of Azusa, yeah. and, uh, you know, now we're here. Yeah, and it actually, interestingly enough, there was a turn four Azusa. It didn't... It ramped him to a turn five Titan, to be fair, instead of turn six. So it's not, it's not that fast. But what it is it's a really robust Azus, a robust Titan. Like, look at, he still has so much game in his hand. We'll see an end step path on Primeval Titan. There is a one of Forest in the deck, so this will get something. And Jarvis still has the option of picking a fight over this. He could patch of negation this path, pay for his Titan, and, and go about his business. Yeah, I think. I think he wants to just let it resolve right now. I think so, too. It's it's pretty risky to fight over that for a number of reasons. He has a more efficient way to get it restarted next turn with the with the Summoner's Pack. And exactly. If he got hit with a Tectonic Edge here, he uh, it, it could mess up his ability to pay. He would lose, yeah. yeah. He has a Titan play next turn. I think that's that's the big reason, is that this gives him a land. Lands are good. This is fine. And he's, no in, he's in no immediate risk of anything too bad happening because he has so many blockers available. Exactly. His colony garden has made him four plant tokens here. I do think if Russell has a removal spell for the next Titan, you will see Jarvis pick a fight over it, though. Yep. Gavany Township for Russell. He's going to swing the team. This represents, well, 12 damage if Jarvis doesn't block it all, so he's going to have to block some of it. See two plants stepping in the way. Yeah, Jarvis not going for the triple jump block here because if Russell wants to spend his entire turn using the township, that's fine. And if Jarvis doesn't jump block with everything, he has access to those jump blockers down the line when maybe there's larger things in play. And Jarvis goes down to five. Back here, Slaughter Pact picked up for Jarvis. And he is, yeah, he's going to just go ahead and just naturally looks like has another Primeval Titan here. He actually via his bounce lands should be able to make, if he hasn't played a land this turn, he could make just, I was saying he could make two Titans this turn. Then he wouldn't be able to haste it, though. So he kind of has the option between hasting this Titan and just making a second one. Sure. He's one mana short. Because the Azusa extra land triggers work, he could get bounce lands here, bounce his lands like Forest or Slayer Stronghold, replay them with his extra land drops, and go get another, be able to pay for another Titan. He's going to get Radiant Fountain and Simic Growth Chamber. It's a one of life gain land. You give him a little bit of a cushion here. Siege Rhino having Trample makes chum blocking a little bit more complicated in the event that something happens to a Primeval Titan. Yeah, this Titan will go ahead and get haste. And on this attack... Yeah. Actually, so it's had he... Had he chosen that turn, I want to just go back to a, the play, a play I mentioned before. Had he chosen that turn to, instead of bouncing the Radiant Fountain that came into play tapped, uh, float a mana and bounce one of his, and bounce one of his untapped lands, and use, and use like. He he could have he could have made two Titans this turn with the three extra land drops. He could have made a Titan, swung, got two more bounce lands, bounced more untapped like lands come into play untapped, and then made a second Titan post combat. Okay. Though the mana's pretty picky about like how you have to sequence it. The combat step really does get in the way a lot of the time. Nonetheless, this Titan's 
going to do a lot of damage. We go back over to Russell, making a Siege Rhino. He does have a lot of damage on Jarvis here, but I would say Jarvis should be able to fight through this. Yeah. I mean, particularly still with, with patch negation left in hand at a moment's notice. Uh, a 6-6 six, six that colds the entire board. Yeah. Jarvis using his extra land drops to cast Radiant Fountain and then Vesuva. Looks like we'll see what he chooses to copy here. He's going to use Vesuva to copy a bounce land, pick up Teleria West, and transmute it. There is a lot going on with this deck. This is one of the hard, I would say of the decks that I regularly play, this is certainly the hardest deck. I never feel like I'm playing it at 100%. The good news is that 80% is good enough to win a lot of matches. <laughs> there are a lot of lines that are just giant puzzles. right now transmuting with Teleria West. He's, what he still has left in his deck is he still has some green number of green packs left. I believe he has two of them. Of his utility lands, he still has Sun Home left. All his other utility lands are already in play. So Sun Home is going to be pretty important here. And he's going to go ahead and get his second pack of negation. Yep. That's, that's a show of strength for sure. And more than enough mana to pay for both the packs. So, Yeah, the Vesuva means he has exactly four blue sources. go back over to Russell. A well-placed kill spell would be inconvenient for Jarvis, but not terrible. He may find some issue that he didn't end up finding a sun home that turn. And because of that, Jarvis won't have a lethal attack. He's not going to force Russell into making bad blocks. Mm -hmm. But because he has enough plants, he may not need to do that. Like He, he still should be in a decent spot. And Russell can't even really offer up a, even an Alpha Strike at this point because the Titan easily goes in front of the Siege Rondo and then there's some other blocks. And trading your Siege Rondo to get some plants off the table is not very good here. And yeah, Russell just giving it up. Yeah, so game one goes over to Jarvis U. It's, I think what's been interesting is that as the format has moved toward when there are slower decks is you know, you always hear about the ammo decks, how they have these turn one and turn two kills, how they do these really broken things. Um, all Jarvis did there was play a turn five primeval titan. Right. I mean, Russell's draw was just, you know, a discard spell into Goyf into Kitchen Finks. That's a lot of time for Jarvis to get set up. Right. I guess Jarvis made some plants along the way to a turn five titan, but that's, that's really it. It's a slower start, feels like, but still good enough. Uh, we'll go ahead and move over to the sideboard here. Um, yeah, it, move over to the sideboard so... Cyber is going to be interesting, and we'll get to that in a second. One thing, though, we do have coming up here, we have released our schedule for Season 3 at the beginning of the... At the end of last year, we said Season 1 and 2. But if you're looking for when the Star City Games Open Series comes near you, we now have the rest of the calendar up. And, I mean, we're starting off in a very exciting way, given the response we've gotten here in Baltimore and the Grand Prix in Richmond last year with a modern Grand Prix in Charlotte, June 12th through 14th. Then we have standard opens in Indianapolis, Baltimore, and Chicago for the first time in Open Series history. A standard open in Richmond, modern in D.C., uh, just a stone's throw away from here. I'm sure it'll be a, a very well-attended event. London for a standard Grand Prix in the middle of August. And then a legacy Open Series back in Charlotte towards the end of August. And as we wrap it up, with the Season 3 Invitational in New Jersey, a standard open series and standard and legacy as the Invitational formats. The end of August, the 28th through 30th, me, you, Senator Phillips in the booth. Yeah, pretty exciting schedule all the way set up. So, do you try, trying to find an event near you when you're coming nearby. Uh, a lot of modern on the schedule, which I'm a huge fan of. Yeah. No, it's, it, it's cool, you know, at, at first, we sort of want to dip our toes in the water, see what the response is, both in terms of tournament attendance and, and viewership and so forth, but... Um, I haven't actually looked at the numbers yet, but by, based on the enthusiasm I'm seeing on social media, uh, a lot of people tuning into this event, and of course, the, the best attended Open Series thus far in 2015. All right. So going to the sideboard here, I want to look at 
what Jarvis is going to end up doing with his deck, because this is a pretty, a lot of his sideboard is devoted to this. Uh, so what he's going to board in is he has a copy of Cigar to Host of Herons, a copy of Hornet Queen, a full three copies of Thrag Tusk, and then three copies of Leyline of Sanctity. Uh, so kind of the game you saw there, where he's not going fast, where he's just sitting back and playing monsters, Jarvis is going to become more of that kind of deck uh, in this matchup. So do you get away from Hive Mind altogether when you're go going in this kind of spot, or do you have the creatures alongside most of your combo still intact? Uh, usually the Hive Mind combo ends up ends up not getting here in this situation. It's too easy for a Thoughtseize deck to try to pick that sort of thing apart. You know, they, they for example, if they Thoughtseize you, they take your Hive Mind. A card like Blue Pact, isn't great here. I mean, Slaughter Pact is, is actively bad. Mm -hmm. So if you want the Hive kill, you have to keep in a lot of excess baggage. And rather than resolving, you know, two halves of, of a combo at six, the combo of I cast Hornet Queen Go is actually pretty strong. Sure. On the other side of the table, Russell here with a Thrun, two copies of Avian Mind Sensor, two copies of Sony Silence, three Fulminator Mage, a Batter Skull, two copies of Zealous Persecution, a Slaughter Pact, two copies of Feed the Clan, one copy of Soren Solemn Visitor, the two copies of Avon Mind Sensor and the three Fulminator Mages stand out to me as the, the best card yeah. that Russell brings to the table. I think one copy of Slaughter Pact in lieu of maybe some other removal spell or some of the Kitchen Things kind of slots, those are okay too. But the five cards that really stand out are the Avon Mind Sensors and the Fulminator Mages. No, and I think you're you're exactly right. That's what he's going to want in this matchup. Um, good two for ones, things that slow Jarvis down. Uh, the Avon Mind Sensor can be pretty backbreaking. There isn't very much removal in Amulet. So once the Mind Sensor gets down, it, it just cripples the whole deck. And it's a slow clock. It's not going to be high impact all the time. It doesn't do very much if Hive Mind's the route the deck's going down, but still worth having. Yeah. And I was going to say, what, he, what Russell has to know when keeping his hand here is that there's a chance that Jarvis just ley lines him on turn zero. Yeah. And we'll see how much damage it just did here. Leyline, very powerful against the discard cards, of course. Also, Liliana the Veil. In spots where you have to play a primeval titan with no protection, it's good there too. Yeah, Liliana can still is actually still serviceable with a leyline in play. The plus ability still works. You can't do anything but plus it. Right, gives you a, a much more of an opportunity to play a primeval titan with no protection. Now, the question is, are there copies of Maelstrom Pulse here in Russell's deck? Can he get leyline off the table? Well, he does have some some pretty inefficient threats here inside of Lingering Souls and Kitchen Finks. He has uh, a fair amount of removal. I, I think there's room to bring it in, but I would not be positive. Oh. I don't know, but I don't, he doesn't have an actual way to remove the enchantment, I don't think. Sure. So this, this ley line is here to stay. We see a turn one Noble Hierarch from Russell. And a Ancient Stirrings from Jarvis. That's going to find a copy of Amulet of Vicar. Using the counter off Tendo Ice Bridge. Jarvis can keep a, hand, a lot of hands because of his ley line that are are kind of bust ups. Like he doesn't, he does not have to be fast because of this. His biggest worry would be that Russell were to ramp out turn three, turn four siege rhino. That would probably be good enough to get Jarvis here. But you see Russell missing his second land drop. That's got to be that is great news for Jarvis. And I think Jarvis's hand has summer bloom as well. So th this could be a pretty crazy turn. So Simic Grow Chamber is going to come into play. It'll untap from Amulet. It's going to make a blue and a green. And then it will bounce itself. So you're absolutely right. Here's Summer Bloom. He has three land drops remaining. He's going to go ahead and use that. If he has the Titan, this is off to the races. I don't believe he does. What he can do is he can go Simic Growth Chamber bounce, Simic Growth Chamber bounce, Tendo. I, well, you need double white for Sigarda. So that actually won't cast Sigarda. Yeah, none of his two mana lands give him a route to white mana. And he needs several of them to be able to get Sigarda and play this turn. Yeah, I'm not positive if he can make the Sigarda at all. He can use this Serum Visions, so he's going to play Summer Bloom and untap it. Even if he doesn't have a combo, just playing Summer Bloom to throw a lot of lands onto the table is pretty defensible here. Right. Especially with, you know, no real risk, you're not under any pressure, and you have uh, a ley line in play. Uh, you're drawing very live off the top of the deck as well. Yeah. Serum Visions draws Serum Visions. He has another Ley Line, and it looks like a Teleria West on top. He probably is interested in Teleria West. Obviously not interested in the second Ley Line of Sanctity. Yeah. And as you mentioned, Jarvis can take a very slow pace with the game because 
he's not under any pre pressure right now. His hand's safe because of the light line. So if he has to take a slower route this game, that's still fine. He'll go ahead and replay land number two. That's going to be Tendo Icebridge. Use the counter op to make a blue mana to cast Serum Visions. And then make two more lands for the turn. Mana Confluence and Gemstone Mine. But that would be one too many. He's already made two. So those are, yeah, just gets to make one of them. It's going to be Gemstone Mine. It does set him up to be able to make Sigarda next turn. And you can look at Russell's hand right now. A thought sees and an Inquisition, just these discard spells rotting. And it's hard to imagine that Siege Rhino is going to be by itself good enough to get this done. Yeah, I mean, it depends what Jarvis has. I was going to say, Russell could make Siege Rhino that turn. He'd have a shot um, of racing Sigarda. But Sigarda, you see there the play for Jarvis. I mean, there's no way Russell knew this is what was coming. I think Russell needs to be needs to go for a proactive line if he wants a chance here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you cannot give this kind of deck all day long. The draw steps just pound for pound are so much better in the amulet deck. And yeah. a lot of Russell's draws are cut off at this point because ley line shuts out a lot of it. Yeah, it's interesting. Amulet top decks really poorly, but when it does top deck some of its game, it's, it's good cards find more copies of themselves. So one Titan, you know, is four Titans. Mm -hmm. And a true three time away. If this does not look like it's going to get the job done for Russell. Russell with virtually no ways to answer a resolved Sigarda. And I believe Jarvis has Primeval Titan as well. You say virtually no ways. I'm seeing just no. no he, can ways. Over, he can try to overpower it, but it, it's, it's in play. So Primeval Titan will be the play from Jarvis. Because the, the Slayer Stronghold's already in play, if he wants to haste it, he's going to have to go with Vesuva Boros Garrison. Which will go ahead and do untap both. Gets to bounce the Vesuva, which is pretty decent. But before that, he can go ahead and give his Titan 2-0 in haste. Titan in no danger of dying in this combat. So is there a lethal line of play from this spot? No, not from, th from this position. There's not a lethal line. Um, the best thing he can do is he can use Primeval Titan to give, to get 2-0 in haste. That's the most damage. Um, yeah, now he's going to get a second trigger as well. I mean, this is not a bad consolation prize. You right. know, you're not killing this turn, but, you know, your, your cigar is still uncontested. You have infinite resources to work with. Slaughter yeah. pack still in hand in case something crazy happens. Yeah, and he got to get Simic Growth Chamber plus Telerio West there on the second pair of Titan of Titan lands during the attack. So he's going to be able to set up. And if he's usually you keep in one blue pack, so he can probably transmute for that just as insurance. Though I'm not really sure what card he'd even be playing around. Next turn he can he can attack with Primeval Titan and Sigarda, go get his uh, Sun Home and double strike the Sigarda, and there's no interaction that Russell should, Russell should have for that line. Right. Like, I guess you could theoretically be worried about something like Damnation, which does not seem like it could possibly be in Russell's deck, but that is some reason to transmute for a blue back here. Some big sweeper. Yeah, so even if there's a Damnation, if Russell plays Damnation, actually, Jarvis, because he got that Teleri West, could transmute Teleri West for Green Titan, play Green Titan, give it haste, and sure. swing, swing, and that would that kill way. him. Yep. So he's, he is actually safe from that just because he got the Teleri West. The, the Teleri West engine is is actually a, a really big part of this deck. I've actually found when uh, interesting interactions, I remember I played against a Tron player who his strategy for Amulet, against Amulet was to just resolve uh, engineer explosives on zero. And that's actually pretty decent against the deck. Sure. So a, trouble, a double chump block here from Russell, to me implies that he's trying to set up some term involving murderous cut. Yeah, and that'll be pretty good, but there's still this problem that Russell's at a really low life total and Sigard is there. She's going to get double strike. So actually, Jarvis can just transmute for the, the Sun Home and just play it and then double strike Sigard, and that's 10 in the air. Yeah, we'll check on life totals here. I believe Russell took... Yeah, I believe he should be at 9. Yep. So yeah, if, if Jarvis just transmutes for Sun Home, that's lethal next turn. Doesn't always have to go get a pact. Well, if Russell is able to both play 
a Murderous Cup for one mana and a Siege Rhino, then that gets him gets another, to... another turn. Not that, that That's not a long-term solution. Well, but... it depends. I don't know. I'd have to count whether Jarvis has enough mana to transmute for Sunhome, activate Sunhome, activate Slayer Stronghold. Oh, okay. Yeah, just double that, up. That Vesuva there is set to Slayer Stronghold. Yeah. So he may just be able to 14 him still. Gets rid of the Primeval Titan. And looks like Jarvis is heads up on that one. And the draw that turn was Hornet Queen, which is a fine backup policy yeah. if something bad were to happen inside of combat here. And there you go. The transient for Sunhome, double strike for Sagarda, and that will be it. 2-0, Jarvis U defeats Russell Martin. And you can see kind of the problem that, that Obzon has in a matchup like that, where the clock's just not that fast. I, I think that if Russell has access to his discard spells, he's fine there. Right. But the white ley line just, just shut him out. And at that point, he's just a deck of not very efficient creatures, and that gives Jarvis all the breathing space to do his thing. Yeah, so there are ways he can interact there. So say, for example, he had a turn three Fulminator Mage. When Jarvis went for Summer Womb, he can just he could just Fulminator Mage away the Bounce Land. Um, yeah, Leyline's a pretty big beating and can be pretty can be pretty wrecking in that matchup. Uh, a lot of times, like I said, if if Russell had been on his land drops and just slammed turn three, turn four Siege Rhino, like Russell has a chance to win there. He can actually race it. So is there a way to sort of shore up that dex? You know, you, you've mentioned a lot. It's light on action. There's only so many cards of substance. Uh, so counter spells, well time, and discard spells, mm -hmm. they can be pretty bad. And now you're talking about, you know, maybe just a curve of Siege Rhinos being good in a certain percentage of games. Is there a way to shore up those liabilities, or is so much of your deck just consumed by the combo space that it, it is, just is what it is? The deck list, there are very few cards that are even playable inside the deck list. Um, so, you, I mean, yeah, it, it's basically, it, it's on the level of, I guess, like Legacy Storm, where you, there are very few cards you can work with. Um, the reason you have such a big sideboard plan against Obson is there just aren't that many cards that you want to board in in this deck. Sure. Um, you have very little card selection. A lot of your cards are bounce lands. I think you have about you have about eight car eight slots that you can even work with. So some of its bad matchups are preying on you know prey on the fact that it has a bunch of bounce lands in the deck, and there isn't really a way to shore that. Yeah. So it looks like we're going to be heading over to back up here momentarily. All right, yeah, we have a, a pretty good matchup here between Rudy Brixa and Kevin Jones. This is a Splinter Twin Mirror, actually, between them. Both of them playing Blue Red Twin. One of the more popular decks today, the Mirror is actually really interesting between between the two decks. Both decks are so good at interacting at instant speed. Both decks involve, uh, you know, spell skates in the mix. And you can see Kevin with... Uh, what I would argue is one of the most important cards in the matchup with Desolate Lighthouse. Because these decks are all just sort of staring at each other for a while. It's very hard to go for the kill. Yeah. And so you can just improve your hand over time. All right, so we're late here in game two. Kevin Jones up a game. Currently, Kevin has nine lands in play. As you said, importantly, one of them is Desolate Lighthouse. Seems to have some inevitability against Rudy's just five land hand. However, yeah, Kevin also with Batter Skull in place certainly seems to have Rudy on the back foot. But the life totals are pretty even. 11 for Kevin, nine for Rudy. Burning the other person out, certainly not unrealistic in the matchup. The nature of these two decks makes it hard to go for the kill. So uh, instead, you get these games that drag out like this, where they almost start resembling traditional blue-red control decks. See here, Rudy snap casting back a lightning bolt. Kevin with a snapcaster mage of his own. His is going to go ahead and look like get remand for the for this flashback lightning bolt. Rudy will bolt away the snapcaster mage with. I believe before Kevin gets to draw off Remand. And we'll see. Kevin's last card is Cryptic Command here. Both players at one card in hand. Rudy needing to kill every creature of Kevin's. I don't, once Batter Skull get, jumps on one of them, it should be lights out. And Kevin is going to fight that fight. It looks like he's going to go ahead and Cryptic Command away the Lightning Bolt. So we have. A draw off Cryptic Command, Lightning Bolt's countered. Now we have a draw off Remand, the Flashback Lightning Bolt is countered. And this is all on Kevin's end step. So Kevin goes to nine. Yeah, Kevin just trying to set up uh, inevitability with Batter Skull at a relatively high life total here. Okay, actually the, the uh, Cryptic Command bounced Snapcaster and drew a card. So it's one better than countering Lightning Bolt and drawing a card, right, which is just, why it's back in his hand. Just exhausting all of Rudy's resources. I mean, Rudy's still working with Snapcaster and Cryptic Command, so his hand's about as good as it can be for this kind of situation, but he's still in some big trouble. Yeah. 
Snapcaster Mage swings into Spellskite. Ken Kevin Enstep is going to go ahead and bounce his own Batter Skull. See Cryptic and Snapcaster in Rudy's hand. Dropper Kevin, Deceiver Exarch. And he does not want to redeploy Batter Skull just yet into the face of blue mana. Kevin's pretty content. I imagine Kevin's content sitting on the board because he's the guy with the Desolate Lighthouse. Exactly. I mean, he's got uh, just all the inevitability at this point. Snapcaster will swing, and Kevin here is going to try to get a little bit of value, flashing in Deceiver Exarch into play to try to just block Snapcaster Mage. And this is pretty rough for Rudy because he almost has to fight over this, but he it's... has no long-term answer to the Batter Skull. Yeah. I, I suppose the negate he's picked up gives him a shot at being able to fight a battle over it. Like, this isn't the spell he wanted to Cryptic Command. But he will. He'll try to Cryptic Command countering Deceiver Exarch. Let's see what Kevin has back. Looks like Kevin does want to fight over this one. He does have Snapcaster Mage in his hand. Rudy knows about that. And here comes a counterspell. Snapcaster Mage will come into play. We do not know what it's going to flash back. Rudy will almost certainly have to negate whatever Kevin picks here. Yep. This fight is getting way too costly. Kevin debating between Cryptic and Remand. He'll go ahead for flashing back Cryptic Command. And that will be negated. So negate for Cryptic Command happens. Rudy's Cryptic counters the Deceiver Exarch. Rudy draws up Cryptic. Now Snapcaster's still attacking. Kevin can choose to block with Spellskite or his own Snapcaster. Yeah, I mean, Rudy wins the fight here but loses the war. Right, because now Kevin gets to resolve the Batter Skull. Kevin untaps with a lot of open mana. Starts with Serum Visions, draws a card. Scries one top, one bottom. Rudy still with some weapons in his hand, but the tap out here is pretty dangerous, and it is going to be Batter Skull for Kevin. His remaining hand looks to be Land and Negate. Yep, very potent package here. Yeah, the Land can be looted away from the light, using the Lighthouse. If you're Kevin, you just need to make sure you don't get burned out, I would think. Yeah, and Batter Skull, once that starts connecting, that's no longer on the table. Yeah. Karanos, God of Storms, the play for Rudy. Despite the fact that it's an enchantment right now, when it's on the stack, that sure is a creature, so negate cannot happen there. Kevin will loot on that step, but now he untaps. Gets to get a swing in, though, looks like, with Batter Skull. That'll put Rudy down to five. Ancient Grudge, a draw for Kevin. Kevin, right now, without an answer to Karanos, Rudy's got a shot. Well, uh, you know, he's gaining life. The bolts off of Karanos don't matter that much because right. Kevin's board is just four fours. And Rudy is running out of time here. So drawing a card is nice, but you feel like with Snapcaster Mage and the gate in hand, uh, Kevin can probably protect himself from whatever Rudy cobbles together. Yeah, two lands, a free land drawn from Rudy, then draws a land for the turn. He'll pass. He still has a pair of Snapcaster Mages in his hand, so Rudy's going to need to make these ones count. Attacking with Batter Skull, Rudy has to flash in Snapcaster Mage. Goes to his graveyard. We see Bolt, Negate, Cryptic Command, Spell Snare. Tons of options. Harvest Pyre even. Looks like he's going to go for Harvest Pyre. He's going to delve, well, not going to exile away enough to kill it. Four of them. And will it take down the germ token? We'll see. Kevin will start off by peeking at Rudy's hand. I am... Just very amused by Peak being in these decks and not get Taxi Probe. I understand you would want to operate as much as in speed, but it is charming. Land, Mountain and Snapcaster are Rudy's cards. The Peak resolves. Now Kevin gets to fight over Harvest Fire and choose how. He drew, looks like a Vendillion Click. And he will go ahead and cast Vendillion Click on Rudy. And he may just let this Harvest Pyre, well, happen. I would think. Another Snapcaster Plink Mage into play. It's going to go ahead and flashback. That looks like actually a Dispel in the graveyard. Yeah. And uh, I, I agree with you. I don't think Kevin really needs to do anything about this. He can just move the equipment over to the flyer next turn, right? Right. Another Snapcaster Mage from Kevin. Stack getting awfully big here. But Rudy already has a, a Dispel with flashback at the ready. So it looks like the Snapcaster just snapped back peak, and now the stack gets to resolve. Looks like the Harvest Pyre did not take. Snapcaster Mage did jump in front of the Germ Token. Kevin went up to 17. 
land for Rudy. He'll go ahead and pass the turn. Down at five, Kevin just exhausting Rudy's resources here. Right, and now the Seaver x Arc is the last card in hand, so if there's some way for Kevin to win the, the battle here, he can just move the Batter Skull onto a flyer. And he has Spell Sky at the ready, so he has protection against the Seaver x Arc. Yep, Seaver x Arc. there, there you go, is. moves equipment. Rudy tries to Seaver x Arc. kick, Kevin moves over to the Spell Sky, and 2-0, Kevin Jones, Blue Red Twin, defeats Rudy and moves up to four and one. Right, I, I think Kevin did a very good job navigating those